Good afternoon and welcome to Strategies for Improving the Data Quality in Your Health System, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Intelligent Medical Objects. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO and I'll be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box and we will take those later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Rob Bart, Dr. Rob Bart, CMIO at UPMC, Dr. David Kelber, CMIO and VP of Health Informatics and Patient Engagement Technologies with the Metro Health System, and Dr. Dick Taylor, Chief Clinical Informatics Officer with BJC Healthcare. We're also joined by Dale Sanders, Chief Strategy Officer with Intelligent Medical Objects and my very old and good friend. I have to say that, Dale. I just have to throw that in. Um, all right, let's jump right in. We have a great panel today and lots to talk about. So, uh, Rob, can we start with you? Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, so UPMC is a 40 plus hospital system predominantly located in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, we have one outpost in Western New York and also one in Western Maryland. Um, where we deliver care. And uh, we are a multi-EHR system that, that uh, has multiple different inpatient as well as two instances of an ambulatory electronic health record. Mm -hmm. uh, my role as the CMIO is really to oversee sort of the content management and workflow of all the clinical systems and how they all inter interoperate or usually sometimes not interoperate with each other, um, as the case may be. Um, thanks, Anthony. Very good. Thank you, Rob. David? Well, pleasure to be with everybody this afternoon. Yes, yeah, so the Metro Health System is a pulling or a safety net health system in, in the greater Cleveland area, um, not as big as uh, UPMC. I think one difference that maybe will be germane to, to our discussion is um, we basically have one electronic health record. It's the EPIC electronic health record that we use throughout our inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, we've been on EPIC for over 20 years. Um, so it's interesting to think about, you know, sort of data quality as data standards change, you know, over the decades as well. Um, so hopefully I can bring uh, some of those uh, perspectives to this discussion. Yeah, as the CMIO um, for going on 14 years now at the Metro system really um, the clinical lead for for everything dealing with technology in our in our healthcare system. Thank you very much, David. Dick. Yeah, I'm Dick Taylor. I'm the Chief Clinical Informatics Officer for BJC Healthcare and Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, BJC Healthcare is a multi-hospital system in uh, the St. Louis metropolitan area, including Illinois. And uh, Washington University, of course, is an academic um, health system with a footprint across the country. Um, my role as the Chief Clinical Informatics Officer is really to be responsible for workflows uh, around clinical medicine that includes uh, physician practice, that includes nursing practice. Um, we're doing a lot with, uh, with telemedicine, doing a lot with uh, home care. Um, and then uh, also, we're a little bit newer on the EPIC world. We're uh, fully EPIC, but we're uh, uh, one of the later entrants in the, in the uh, market. And so we're still figuring out where everything goes and getting everything set up. So um, I help oversee that. So a uh, fairly broad role, but a lot of focus on this informatics question. Very good. Dale? Hi, everybody. Um, Dale Sanders, Chief Strategy Officer at IMO. I didn't know we were the sponsor for this. So how about that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, as Chief Strategy Officer, you know, it used to be that really meant you were putting somebody out to pasture, right? Because they couldn't handle anything else. But um, I actually feel pretty useful in this role at IMO. Uh, I was a client of IMO when I was chief analytics and CIO at, at uh, Northwestern 15, 16 years ago. I was one of uh, IMO's first clients when we had Epic and Cerner on the campus. Um, and I just try to help, you know, as chief strategy officer, help with product development, marketing. Um, I'm a big believer that we've got to improve uh, terminology and standards for interoperability as well as analytics. And that's the reason I joined IMO was to try to affect um, clinical data quality at the beginning of the life cycle. And also I'm super passionate about 
trying to make the lives of physicians, uh, the data lives of physicians um, easier and better than what it is right now, both the collection of data, but also the way we present and analyze data and give it back to clinicians. So great to share, great to share the, the webinar with everybody. Thank you. Uh, we already have a great comment in the Q in the Q and A box. Nobody puts Dale out to pasture. Ah. So, <laughs> see that you got a lot of support out there, Dale. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, first question, uh, Rob. We're gonna start with you. Okay. To set the table for our discussion, describe the variety of ways data enters a healthcare organization's computer system. How can errors occur during these points of entry and be corrected? And do healthcare IT executives have a role in improving the data entry process? Is this an area they can or should have influence? Anywhere a, you uh, want to jump in with that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that, that we do play a role in that and thinking about how um, we set up our electronic health records. Um, and, and I'll use that maybe as the key example. So we have a variety of... Uh, EHRs within the ambulatory, acute care, and post-acute space. And they frequently have challenges with different ways or limitations of how data can be put in or entered. Um, you know, it's predominantly entered by humans, but either keystroke or, or voice these days. And uh, how you address that and clean it up is quite a bit different. Um, as we all know, most um, clinicians don't, aren't very good editors of what they document, which, which creates a challenge. Um, and um, there's always this balance between discrete data documentation and sort of the, the text blob or the note, and you get varying views on the value of those. Um, as it relates to discrete data documentation, um, as, as thoughts have evolved over the years, and, and, and I've thought about it, we've really tried to sort of tune the lists that people might be choosing from, if it's checkbox related documentation, try and not leave it in an alphanumeric sort of model, but actually in a frequency of use, because as we all know, whatever is at the top of the list, if you end up having to scroll, is always going to get the most attention. And that's really not going to be very useful in the organization as they're trying to translate that data element into information for operations. Um, we've also gotten rid of the as, as many not applicable type of categories in any of these multi-choice lists um, as possible. So, you know, limiting scrolling, um, trying to create the appropriate uh, discrete documentation choices, um, eliminating the other category because that ends up being something that's extremely hard to sort of translate and also use for the organization. Um, so that's with the discrete. I think... Um, my most recent interest, and I would say in the last five to eight years, has been more in the voice space and or the natural language processing or NL, NLU that goes with that, um, whether it's uh, these days, whether it's entered by the keyboard or voice, utilizing that in a much cleaner mechanism to try and start parsing it. Um, the, our, most of our physicians um, and APPs uh, feel that that narrative story communicates more context about the patient, but that context about the patient becomes a challenge when you're trying to leverage discrete data to understand more about either your patient population or how your operations work. And so being able to start parsing that for the valuable pieces of information and also the intent on whether it's a context of not pertinent or it is pertinent is very important. And I think that area has grown quite a bit where we're now able to take what used to be the non-discrete to create the discrete. And that's become much richer, um, particularly when we're trying to understand how we manage patients to better outcomes. Very good, David, your thoughts. Yeah, I guess I would echo a lot. I think a couple of the, the sort of additions I would add would be, I think traditionally, you know, most data was entered as part of, a, of, a, of an actual visit, you know, sort of a synchronous visit, either in person or, you know, recently more telehealth. Um, so, you know, we see all that. I think other areas that I see um, that are sort of more emerging is data through health information exchange. Um, and to me, that's very interesting because, you know, I'm getting sent discrete data from somebody else. Um, 
And a lot of times I have problems processing it. And, and, and the, the question is, is it really a data error? Um, again, there's tons of details we can describe, but you know, I'd say we saw this in spades with, with COVID-19, where one of the first things we saw was that people were not mapping CVX codes to their COVID-19 immunization. So I have like, you know, an emergency CMIO call with all the other CMIOs in my neighborhood saying, hey, it's great that you're sending me COVID vaccination stuff, but you haven't mapped it to CVX codes. So mm -hmm. I can't intelligently you know, process it. So is that, you know, I don't know if that's a data error or not, but, but it's just that this whole group of data that's now coming in from other electronic health records through health information exchange. Um, another mm -hmm. error I'd point out is patient generated data, I think is again, and, and, and that adds up a whole, I mean, on some level that's great because you get patients doing data entry for you. But I would say, if you think, um, you know, healthcare staff and providers are not that good data entry people, Think about now you have patients doing data entry. And the, to me, that takes two forms. It can be patients sort of, you know, manually entering either discrete data or undiscrete data. And then I think when you get into the whole, you know, patient uh, like remote monitoring or like a hospital in the home space, then you have patients that can be connected up to devices um, that are either manually or automatically entering the data. And there you have an issue of, to me, sometimes patients um, introducing errors or the device ent introduces errors, right? So, you know, how many people have seen a pulse ox that, you know, is reading 5%, but yet the patient is breathing right in front of you. So, you know, that the pulse ox in that patient <laughs> cannot be 5%, but yet, you know, the data that's in the system is, is 5%. So anyway, I guess I would just add those two areas, both the patient enter data and mm. then all of that health information exchange data that we're getting. But I, I guess to, then to briefly just end, I would say, I think there's a huge role for the health IT executive in this space because there's a lot of strategic decisions that, you know, when you're setting these systems up can be huge in, you know, increasing the quality and the usefulness of, of both these data streams as they come in. And it's, David, it's sort of a side issue, but, you know, you mentioned that 5% uh, number that's a reason to immediately have someone go to the ER if it was accurate, right? right? So so yeah. now you have it, we now you're exposed more. to it, right? You're exposed to the information. So to what degree are you responsible for acting off it? And so you got to follow up and find out because if you don't do anything, they say, but you had this data, it, it came mm -hmm. to you. And you. So any quick thoughts there? Well, yeah, we, we just recently turned on um... Uh, the Google uh, or the um, Google Fit and uh, Apple Health Kit integration with MyChart, and so just sort of a microcosm of that is you have to set up panic values where someone will be immediately notified. So right again, as as a primary care physician myself, I'm an internist and pediatrician. You know, I don't want every single blood pressure, or every single pulse ox, or every you know from my patients. But I mean, I'll just I'll give you a, a real life example. So um, you know, to me, because I was involved in the setup. I said, hey, let's notify, uh, the default should be notify a provider when the pulse rate is uh, 50 or below. Well, pretty quickly, I found that in some of my really athletic patients, right. they could easily get heart rates in the 40s. <laughs> so I'm starting to get all these notifications, you know, about heart rates in the 40s, where again, you know, the, you know, the first couple I'm like, my chart messaging, hey, like, are you still okay? And they're like, Oh yeah, I, I was sleeping. You know, I'm a runner. Of course, you know my heart rate normally goes down to the 40. So again, you gotta you gotta try to adjust that with all that the, you know the right clinical scenario. And I think you know part of the challenge is, you know, what's an abnormal value for one patient and really should be followed up on might be a totally normal value for another patient. And you know how do we tease that out either clinically or how do we tease that out through some sort of machine learning, artificial intelligence? Because I don't want to be spending my time on things that seem potentially abnormal, but are actually very normal for a particular patient. Very good. Dick, your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I concur with my panelists to this point. I think that the, uh, the issue for me, and it's almost a theoretical issue at this point, we're exposed to so many sources of error now. You know, we, we have the patient reported outcomes, we have the clinician entered data. We know our clinicians don't enter data very well. Um, we know that uh, their errors are not randomly distributed, that they make errors, uh, you know, Rob, you mentioned errors of adjacency or errors of, of, uh, errors of opportunity. 
Um, I think that uh, as we start to look at this, we start to understand how bad our data is. Uh, and it's not bad in the sense that it's not fit for purpose. It's bad in the sense that if you thought you would, uh, you would always get accurate information from any source, um, you're going to be disappointed. And these days, the disappointment is more visible and more evident. Um, I think that uh, fundamentally, we need to understand that. And we need to have a tolerance for error and a tolerance for, um, for uncertainty that is more explicit. Uh, you know, my, my own philosophy on errors in, in the medical record um, is that the probability of error rises as, the, as you get a mismatch between the need to curate a particular piece of data and the opportunity or the, the desire to do so. Mm -hmm. um, in the ED, a blood pressure is largely, uh, is largely taken to make sure that you have one. Um, we're not really, we're, we're not sitting you down and calming you down and, and giving you the time necessary to give a proper internal medicine uh, blood pressure. Um, but we don't care because what we really want to know is do we need to act on something right now? So the opportunity in the situation is important. We need to carry that over to the home care as well to the, uh, to the patient reported data, Apple health kit data. We don't even know what to do with that heart rate in the, in the 40s, David, because the other thing, of course, is uh, just because your heart rate's in the 40s doesn't mean you're okay. You as a runner may actually have hypertension you're having a, a sort of a normal response. Your, your body is saying, yeah, your blood pressure is 140 over 100, and therefore I'm going to drop your heart rate a bit to keep your, your uh, cardiac output normal. Um, that's a normal physiologic response to an abnormal physiologic situation. So do you investigate it? Do you not? Um, these are questions that we don't really know the answer to. And I, I think the biggest thing the healthcare IT executives can do, and I think need to do, is they need to understand that their systems are shining a light on this in a new way. Um, as we're exposed to the automation, uh, you mentioned COVID vaccines. Uh, the issue with, uh, with COVID vaccinations that we saw was that the uh, admission dates, the administration dates were obviously wrong, evidently clearly wrong. We had patients who were recorded as having had their first COVID shot in 1938. Well, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. And the reason, the reason I'm pretty sure it didn't happen is that actually happens to be the patient's real actual birth date, which means somebody put the number, put the number down in the wrong field. Mm. Um, so as, as, we, as we find these, the healthcare IT executives are going to be getting these reports. They're going to be hearing, well, your data is terrible coming out of the immunization registry. Awesome. What do you do about it? What, what you do is you turn around to the clinicians and you say, A, does it matter? And B, if it matters, what do you want us to do about this particular set of errors? The medical record is never going to be error-free. The, the quality of the data, um, the only thing you can do if you massage it is make it worse. You know, information theory says you can't add information after the fact. Um, but, uh, but sometimes you can shine light on things by deleting certain portions. Sometimes the, the natural language processing, the ML AI algorithms are useful. Sometimes they're just distraction. And I think that that's the other thing that I would say is that the healthcare IT executives can really help avoid the distractions by not chasing the bright, shiny stuff and by helping us understand, are we delivering the care we want to deliver? What are those numbers showing us? And if we are, okay, this other stuff becomes interesting, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a hobby at that point. And so helping to differentiate the important from the peripheral has never been more important. Wow, a lot there, Dick. Very, very well said. Good stuff. Um, Dale, your thoughts to any of the points you've heard so far or the yeah, main question? So many good thoughts. I don't even know where to start to react to all this, but let me, let me just say this, that um, I'm going to put a little bit of a blame on EHR design and user interfaces. Uh, you know, in the rest of our lives, we interact with applications all the time. They're using master reference data in the background to check what the human is entering, right? And you get alerts and pop-ups to correct the data. Uh, we forgot to do that with high tech, right? And EHR design really didn't allow for that kind of thing very easily. Um, the other thing, you know, that, and this is one of the reasons that I joined IMO, speaking, I was a former CMIO, even though I'm not a clinician when I was at Intermountain. And we had our own master reference library, thanks to Stan Huff one of the vocabulary terminology experts, you know, in the field, one of the leading thinkers, we were very deliberate about managing our clinical vocabulary standards in the background so that when data was entered, it was checked against that vocabulary, right? That's one of the things I would like to make easier at, through IMO to the industry is 
Um, not everybody can have a Stan Huff, right? But what I'd like to design is a master reference data library that everyone using an EHR or any other kind of data entry library can access that through an API. And then you take the burden off of the CMIOs and the informatics teams to create and manage that library, right? Because I'm sure you guys can appreciate now you've got relationships with AMA for CPT, you've got WHO for ICD, you've got SNOMED over here, right? And it goes on and on, not to mention there are no standards for SDOH or patient generated data yet. So I really, one of the things that I want to do at IMO is to make that master reference data library an easier thing for all of us to adhere to. Um, there's a company called GS1 that I'd like to emulate. GS1 is kind of the caretaker of barcodes and UPC codes. So for manufacturing, retail, and that sort of thing, it's a not-for-profit. Um, they manage more than just that, but they're a very effective master reference data resource for a variety of industries except healthcare. So I think we need something like that other than, you know, we've all tried to use UMLS, right, over the years. That doesn't work. So, um, you know, doing something better at the front end of care with the EHR design technically needs to improve. The other thing, I'll leave one more thought here too, friends. I'd love to hear the physicians react to this later. I really believe that our current quality measure strategy in the U.S. is affecting data quality in a negative way. It's really not doing anything, in my opinion, to dramatically improve cost or, or quality of care. It's burdening clinicians. And for the most part, it's single purpose data collection, right? You have to click a box to show smoking cessation. You have to click a box to say, have you, you know, is there violence in the home, right? That's single purpose data collection. And poor clinicians, they've got what, 15 minutes to see a patient. And we're asking them to collect data that has very single purpose. It's not multi-purpose data collection. So I would love for the physicians to organize themselves and stage a revolt against the current quality measure strategy in the US and, uh, and lighten things up and also focus on collecting the data that we can use for more than one purpose. That's yeah, it for me. I, I just wanna add a comment to what Dale said. I, I hope that you are success, successful in your goal, um, whether it's at IMO or, or elsewhere. I, I think it's important that we do that. I mean, I think most of us recognize that the vocabulary of clinical care is very different from the vocabulary required for reimbursement and the vocabulary to hit quality metrics. Exactly. And so each of those, each of those creates this detour in the thought process while you're actually, what you're really trying to do is accomplish care delivery and the communication of the care and your thoughts of that patient. So that those who follow behind, behind you can do that. Um, and that, that I think is the, is the key sort of challenge is which, you know, so you send your CDI specialists out there who are frequently focused on the reimbursement vocabulary. And so, you know, then you, you see this uptick in that for a few months, and then it sort of reverts back to the mean unless you can create some sort of reinforcing process. But that reinforcing process that you put in the EHR starts to detract from the quality of communication about the actual condition of the patient. Okay. So um, I, for one, uh, would, I hope that you're successful because the industry needs that type of uh, thoughtful approach. Well, thanks, Rob. Yeah. I, I really want okay. to do it. Dale, I would I would say that uh, um, I'm both uh, I'm both uh, very supportive and also uh, somewhat skeptical about the idea of of a, of a master uh, reference data set. Um, but I think it's critical to at least have these conversations. the The challenge that we have, frankly, is that this has turned into something of an arms race. And we have the EHR, which exists to placate a number of masters, uh, the, the, the billers being one of them, the regulators being another. Um, the data that's being entered is as good as the providers want it to be. And uh, you know, there's a general rule in, in, uh, uh, in IT, which is that if a job's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Um, if providers don't see the need to, to really enter this data accurately, they'll do the min minimum necessary to check the box. And right. any one of us who's ever I clicked a box that says mark all is reviewed when we're looking at problems, meds, allergies, social history, prob, uh, 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 past surgical history. Okay, but what did you mean by reviewed? Does, did, did it mean that at some point there was an image on your retina that translated to some portion of your optical cortex or does it mean you actually care? And the answer is it's usually the former and not the latter. 
for that Merck all is reviewed because you got to click that so that you can get your quality measure. Well, okay, so the, the real question then is, meanwhile, are you taking care of the patient? And as much as possible, I'd like to align the two so that if you take good care of the patient, that becomes self-documenting in the sense that we have evidence in the chart that says, yes, you did review the problems because you addressed them in your problem-oriented charting. Why do you have to click a box? Um, yeah. and, or, uh, or you did address the medications because you did the medication reconciliation. That in and of itself is enough. Those sorts of things, they're very simple, but I think that uh, we're still at kind of this primitive design stage where we're trying to get overt input from the provider and so we get exactly what we deserve. Dick, it's a funny point you make about <clears throat> if you don't see the value uh, of the data you're entering, um, you do it poorly. Um, it's almost passive yeah. aggressive. If I'm at the doctor where let's say I've been to a doctor before many times and they give me a big fat bunch of papers to fill out, you see how nice my handwriting will be on that. You're not going to be able to read anything on that. Uh, but yeah. again, because I'm like, I don't see the need. I don't, I'm annoyed at having to do it. So I'm going to do it badly. So right. um, it's, it's just amazing, but you're right. Uh, David, your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love Dale's vision. Uh, again, I guess I'm a, I am a little bit skeptical and I, I think there's just, there's, there's lots of things that the electronic health record is trying to do. And I think, and again, I just generalized whenever there's a technology that there are lots of different people that want it to work in lots of different ways that sometimes are competing with each other. Again, it's, it's not necessarily the technology's problem, right? So I mean, you know, I, always, I always tell my team, you know, IT and technology informatics, it's, you know, 10 or 20% about the technology and then 80 or 90% about all the other stuff that's either gonna make or break the technology. And I think, you know, part of the problem we're facing here is not a technology problem. It's more all the other stuff. And that's a real difficult morass to try to work through. But if someone can do it, maybe Dale, <laughs> that would be amazing. I would love to drill on uh, whenever it's appropriate, Anthony. I would love to pick the brain of the panel, especially David and Dick, about their skepticism because I don't want to bite. I don't want to be naive. I want to. You guys can give me product ideas, right? Because I think there's a need for this, and I think I can do it, but I don't want to be naive about it. I mm -hmm. I want to do it now because I'm curious as well. We had two say they were skeptical, so I'm gonna let Dick go first. What is it that right. makes you skeptical? And then Dale, I'd like you to react to his skepticism. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be a little bit of a database geek for just a second, I <laughs> promise to reform quickly. Uh, good, good. Dale, the, pro <laughs> the problem with master reference data in an environment that's, that's as free form and, and context dependent as medicine is that it's not that you won't spot diversions from the data or, or diversions from the master or that you don't, know, don't wanna do something with them it's you, you face two very important questions. The first is, does it matter? And the second is, what are you gonna do about it? And uh, understand that frequently you're, in, you're almost always in a time critical environment, not necessarily time critical that the patient will die, but certainly time critical in the sense that if you think uh, a provider with, a, with 32 patients in their schedule and dinner maybe at, at the far end of home is, uh, is an opportunity, that provider is really watching their steps. They're really thinking about how do I do this stuff as quickly as possible? Um, and they're curating the data that they think is important, but you're gonna face a real issue with where you say, look, you're not conforming. We don't have a conformant process. You're gonna have to basically take that signal, completely divorce it from the provider, take it back to IT or to informatics. Yes, I and my colleagues get to deal with this stuff and say, look, they're just not doing this, this uh, particular health screening. They, they're, entering, they're entering periods rather than data. They're, they're responding to their, the uh, mandatory fields by entering the minimum number of characters necessary and what they're entering is gibberish. And by the way, we see that a lot because people, again, don't see the value. If you're, it's one thing to say, we want conformant processes, we want conformant data. It's quite another to say, okay, what am I gonna do about it if I have systematically non-conformant data? And that's why I'm skeptical, hopeful, but skeptical. Dale? Um, so, yeah, that's interesting, Dave. So my theory is that I, I, I would like to make the basics um, in the drop-down list that you have to deal with as a physician right now, like labs, lab orders, medication orders, problem this diagnosis, right? Sort of those core things. We'll eventually get to SDOH data collection, all that, you know, patient-generated data later. But just make the pick list more clinically relevant. Um, yes, you know, yes. right? As, as, much as, 
as much as possible, Dale, I want to get rid of pick lists. Well, I, yeah, I would, I would like to do that too. I would love to do I, that. I, too. I, I would like to simplify the user interface to the point that it's fast enough to get through that the that the provider can do it. And I agree, by the way, with constraining choices in that way. I'm just saying that at that point, I don't need master data management. I need uh, governance on the on what's in the pick lists and what's in the what what's in front of the provider. But I agree, that's that's kind of the the magic there where you have constrained choices, but where you have free text choices, where you have where, you, yeah. where you're ordering a study and you need to say, what is the indication for the study? That's the part that gets harder. And that's actually the part that's probably more divergent right now. Well, and that's the going into NLP, right? I, I'm of the, like my whole goal would be if I could create a next generation EHR is I would minimize the number of pick lists and things that the check boxes you clinicians have to deal with. And I would start putting a lot more emphasis on extracting discrete data out of NLP. It's dramatically more capable of doing that now than we were even five years ago. Yeah. And then of course you got a language model underneath that NLP extraction, right? The master reference data has to sit underneath that NLP, NLU um, language model. Let's go to David. David, uh, was your skepticism for similar reasons or anything different? Well, I guess, I mean, to me, we're sort of framing the skepticism around technology issues. And again, I think part of it is that other 80 or 90%. I mean, there to me, there needs to be sort of public policy reform, payment mm -hmm. reform. You know, a lot of other players have to see that this is very important and on some level be willing to compromise. And I just don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know if this, I just briefly look in the comment. I mean, you know, any thoughts on how recent positive changes in the ambulatory E&M documentation requirements will impact data volume and or quality? And again, to me, that was like, as a clinician, that was huge, mm -hmm. the fact that they got rid of some of that. Now, in response to the question, you know, I think it's decreasing the note bloat. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't I don't know that the quality of the, the length of the note is shortening, but I don't know if the quality of the note is shortening. But I guess the reason I pivot to that is the idea of, I mean, those are the types of fundamental policy changes, I think, that need to happen in yeah. order to redesign electronic health record from a te technology perspective that makes more sense. Um, but I just, I don't see a lot of will to make some of these policy changes happen that really would be needed, I think, for the, the technology to be significantly streamlined. I would, I agree with that too, David. And, and I'm working with HHS, FDA, CDC, ONC saying, look, everybody understands that, that our data quality from a vocabulary perspective coming out of EHR is not very good right now, right? And COVID put a spotlight on that. So I'm having those discussions with the federal folks right now about how we, you know, ideally through incentives, right? To, um, to do better with all that. But uh, yeah, I totally agree that you can't be naive about the importance of federal work here. Thanks. Rob, I'd like to hear your thoughts. You know, um, as I sort of reflected on, on what my three panelists have, have said around this topic, I think part of the, the challenge I, I do see as I've thought about UPMC, which we also have a health plan as mm -hmm. well as a delivery organization, is I, I'm, I think we can get the delivery side of the equation closer to this master reference data, but we still have to reconcile the payer side of the equation. And the challenge I see on the payer side of the equation might even be a larger barrier because like this panel represents, you know, we, we're much more collegial on the delivery side. Mm -hmm. And at least I'm pretty confident that BJC is not a competitor of UPMC because of our geographies. And that yeah. now that you know, now that I, I know Dick and, and met him here, I, I feel I can reach out to him, and, and I do that with many of my colleagues around these types of questions and others. Yeah. But when I interact with our health plan, they're they're so cognizant of the competition of other payers that they, they really view everything as proprietary in in how they do things. Mm -hmm. And I also you know, and we all work with other multiple payers. And the payers have that approach. And so that, that ends up meaning that, that definitions and interpretations can become proprietary for each of the payers. And I think that's what drives some of these challenges that we have. 
And so um, I think that the, the federal regulation piece, as, as the three of you have, have mentioned, is important. But the lack of alignment on the payer side of healthcare um, in this issue is still, I think, something that's going to drive divergence um, from being able to get to sort of a, a, a single master reference. Yeah, I, I, I'd, Rob, I'd love to get a round of feedback on that. Dick, go ahead. Yeah, Rob, I, 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 I agree with you. I also think that uh, from a payer perspective, they don't much care about what's, what's in that note. The natural language processing in that note's not actually their primary concern. They've got the ICD-10 codes. They've got the CPT codes. They've got the modifiers. They've got the, the, all of the, the, the necessary pieces to pay or deny the claim. Um, and so they're not going to be a force for constraint in, uh, in clinical documentation and the meaningful clinical documentation we're talking about. So I agree. And I think that the competition between them is, is, uh, is critical. I will say, Rob, even when I was out uh, in your neck of the woods for a competing organization, we managed to be collegial. So you're right. The, on, the, on the provider side, and especially the physician informatics side, um, we know we're all sort of on the same side against the common set of foes. But uh, I do think it's, it becomes an interesting landscape. Mm -hmm. David, I'd like your thoughts on the whole payer element to this. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole nother complexity. I think, um, you know, data exchange between payers and providers, it's one of those things like in a public forum, you know, everybody says they want it to happen. Mm -hmm. But the 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 devil is in the details. And I, and I would say, again, it's not the technical details, right? I mean, it would be easy for me to exchange data, you know, all, all of my data with all of my payers. But, you know, people don't want to do it for very fundamental business reasons. And again, to, that gets back to sort of my point, you know, until some of those fundamental business drivers change, um, it, again, it's not a technology problem. People are not going to want to functionally exchange data to the degree that we really want it to happen as informaticists, um, you know, to get the to get the value that we really need. But and so again, it's it's not a technology issue. Dale, I uh, David prompted a thought. I I used to say that I was a data technologist, but now I call myself a data psychologist because it's, it's really the soft skills around this and the policy issues, right? And getting people to trust one another. And um, yeah, all this soft stuff around the data is as important as technology. I will say, you know, I'm a little bit cynical about insurance companies, right? They're, they're generally pretty happy with the data they have right now, right? They don't worry too much about data quality. They're starting to kind of worry about data quality as it relates to if they're a they're getting into care delivery, but you know, for the most part, they're happy with uh, ICDs and CPTs, and uh, so I don't see a whole lot of motivation on the part of payers to address data quality. I really don't. All right, uh, I had a whole bunch of other questions, but I'm really enjoying hearing you guys talk to each other. So we're gonna go to our ask a co-panelist section. Dale, I don't know, did you kind of win already? I think kind of you you threw out a question to everybody. So let's let's go let's get the other guys in here. Um, Rob, I'm going to start with you. Do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Um, yeah, I, I do actually, um, and and probably all three of them can comment. So um, I think David was the one that commented that he has an epic domain that's over 20 years old. So I've got multiple EHRs that go back to the mid 90s, right? And so this is something. You know, people are very thoughtful about the curation and implementation of the EHR. And then there's like, you know, loss of discipline that immediately occurs. And there's, weird, there's this weird amoebic growth that occurs within EHRs. And so that's occurred here for 20, 25 years or more. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to really sort of be more thoughtful because, I mean, there, there's truth to the fact that you only add things to electronic health records. You actually almost never remove things. Mm -hmm. And and I would love to get sort of my panelists' thoughts on, on that, because that actually is one of the things that really impacts the quality of the data and that necessity of the data. And I think that we've lost that, that thought around what is necessary. And I'll give you uh, one clear example. Our nursing admission database um, piece that, you know, is done on every patient admitted to the hospital, it had gone up to over 700 data elements, right? And so we parse that back to about just over 200. 
right? You know, and part of that was understanding use. Like there were certain things that no one ever actually went back to re review and look at. Part of it was certain things were put in because of some uh, PA Department of Health requirement a decade ago, but that requirement has gone away. So, so different things of that nature. But that's an area where, um, to I think Vic has spoken to this a little bit about the about sort of curating and sort of really getting it to the data of use which is really what we're trying to achieve much more within the EHR. So I, I'd like to get their perspectives on it and, and then how they might approach it. And then maybe Dick, since he has a younger EHR system, how he's thinking about managing that going forward. All right, Dick, why don't you start us off? All right, so I'm gonna ask I'm gonna answer your last question first. Uh, so we actually are really looking at this. So we have a younger EHR, but of course we had multiple EHRs that sort of got folded, spindled, mutilated and stuffed into the <laughs> current EHR. And uh, I think that the the reality of this is that uh, um, we're, we're trying as hard as we can to reduce the amount of bloat in the data to look at what we're putting in to, to uh, look, not even so much at the data itself, but at the workflow processes that generate it. So if I can get one reliable piece of data and I can replicate it as necessary, that's great. Um, if I have a nursing admission database that's used in in too many situations with too many nurses and we're trying to make it the be all and the end all. Yeah, that's the kind of a thing where we're really taking a strong look at that. We're using the, the uh, frankly, the, the emergency in the industry, which is the, the staffing issues um, to say we, we can't ask more from our clinical staff. And as a matter of fact, we have to look at creative ways to ask less. Well, one of the ways you can do it is by saying, not only are we going to document by exception, which a lot of folks have tried, but we're actually going to try and enforce that and, in, and create a culture where we call out the important stuff and the stuff that isn't important, we leave aside. That's actually going to have some interesting effects on data because data completeness, we expect to go down if you document by exception, where data uh, relevance and data accuracy will probably go up. Um, again, uh, that, that opportunity to curate is dependent on time. If you're making me enter 500 elements, um, I can't, I don't have the time to get it right. If you're yeah. making sure, if, if I need 10 things about this patient that nobody should forget, could probably do that in the two or three minutes that I have available for that task. So this is a, this is a, an area that we're fighting. We're already fighting it constantly and we're fighting it from that clinical informatics side, focusing on the, the, the precious currency of time and clinician attention, and then using that to help understand how the data we produce can be more useful. David, I'll let you take a swing. Yeah, I guess, I don't know if this is a helpful comment. I would say, I feel your pain. <laughs> and, and But I, my, the, sort of the commentary I would give, I think the problem is it's very hard to get strategic initiatives and strategic resources around, you know, cleaning up data or making it better. Um, I mean, if there's, a, if there's a huge imperative, like, um, hey, you know, our heat measures aren't good enough for a paper performance, you know, there it is. But just the normal, care and feeding of data quality you know one of my biggest challenges i can't i can't make it an, an institutional priority because it's very hard to explain the value proposition around doing that now i mean i love what what you're saying dick of hey let's use this crisis right of a staffing shortage to say we 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 have to do it so that's sort of an existential threat that is now making it a priority but i would just say you know yeah. it's been very hard in my institution because we've got this 20 year old data now except in very poignant examples to get the resources that are needed to, to clean up or, or you know, maintain a quote unquote relatively clean system from a data perspective. Dale? Oh man, as usual, lots of thoughts prompted by all these great comments. Um, you know, one of, the, one of my, by the way, you know, they, they tell me that Sagittarians are naive. So you guys get ready, there's more coming. The, uh, you know, one of the things that I'd like to do is um, I would like to, well, re-engineer quality measures from the ground up, essentially, you know, and, and Don Berwick and all, you know, Brent James, all of the folks that had early influence on my career all agree that quality measures are not working. And so it's time to step back and, and ask ourselves, what should quality measures really be, number one? But number two, what I'd like to do is say part of our quality measures are data quality measures, right? So not a clinical process quality measure, but a data quality measure, right? And as long as you submit data that's of high quality, and I agree that's not an easy thing to define, but we can do it, then you get reimbursed for that because we know that we can repurpose that multi-use data for all sorts of quality improvement later on. 
Um, let's see. What I, and Rob, am I on your question? I can't remember, Ben. I'm kind of going off topic, I think. Oh, no, I, um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts, and I think you are addressing it. Okay. The other thing that I would, um, I've wondered, you know, I don't know if it's possible or not, but it, it would be great if we could figure out a way to create command centers that are monitoring patients in a way that clinicians don't have to, right? Uh, you know, I came from the military, NSA background, Air Force officer, and all that sort of thing. I grew up in the command center environment. And it just seems to me that there's an opportunity in healthcare to create command centers staffed with people that are monitoring patients and maybe even put them into what I call a digitician role. So they're collecting data about those patients and in, in, in rounding out patient care in ways that clinicians don't have to. So that when an encounter comes along, the physician can spend the time on that encounter, not on, uh, on data entry. Any thoughts on that? I want to jump in on that. Give some feedback yeah, I, on that. I, I think we're doing that. I think actually, Dale, that that's in a couple of areas. And it's interesting because it's it's the two ends of the spectrum. Um, EIC, our, our EICUs are being repurposed to not just be EICUs, but also to be um, sepsis watchtowers, anesthesia watchtowers, you know, basically following more and more of the high acuity, high danger situations, letting the electronic systems drive the alerts to those folks rather than the primary care, primary caregivers at the bedside. Um, so in acute care medicine, in very highly technical medicine, I think we're doing it. And of course, um, we call it population health management. Um, but the reality is that we, if, if where we have owned risk, we, if we've discovered, if we basically create a control tower and it's, it's a, it's a nursing pool, but it's a, it's a group of people whose job it is to monitor these patients digitally to uh, respond to them. We actually stood this up during COVID, monitored tens of thousands of our patients who had been diagnosed with COVID um, awesome. and, uh, and, and did that work directly. I think that, that that's actually a really good um, paradigm for where we need to go. I hate that word, but it, it's, it's where we need to go in healthcare. Um, this should be more and more of a team sport. So rather than focusing all of our data interventions on the caregiver at the bedside, Great. Let's get what we can out of the bedside. Let's get what we can out of out of the, the physician. But we've got we've got other people who can contribute their piece. The big challenge we face is reimbursement. There is getting paid for that work. But in an owned risk model, that's not the question. The question is whether your costs are, are competitive relative to leaving it alone, and you you avoid a few adverse outcomes. You you avoid killing a few patients. All of a sudden, you you you've you've, you've got an ROI that's hard to argue with. So I really like that idea, Dale. All right, very good. Um, David, i give you an opportunity to ask uh, a question to one or more of your co-panelists. Sure, I would just, I would build on something that Dale commented on. I wonder <clears throat> if anybody has come up with a tool or a strategy to actually measure data quality within their environment globally. Because I think, you know, one of my challenges is, you know, again, if there's a burning platform, then someone's coming to me saying, hey, you know, I need your help. But I, I would love some sort of dashboard or something where I could look out of all the data I have and say, hey, you know, these are the spaces that you should be concentrating on. And again, to me, I, I, I can't be proactive. I'm really just reactive. And I wonder if, if any of you have found sort of a, a special approach, a tool, you know, something that would allow me to be more proactive in thinking about data quality and data air issues across my enterprise. Dale, might you have something like that? Well, yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want it, but part of, you know, I'm a vendor, but really what I am, friends, is I'm an advocate for patients and physicians disguised as a vendor. And so one of the things that we're building right now at IMO is a data quality dashboard so that we can come in and, and profile your data quality for you and say, look, here's where we think you can make some improvements. And that starts with, you know, essentially a comparison against master reference data. That's where it starts. But then it, it's more complicated than that about the use of data and that kind of thing. But it starts with that comparison to a master reference data. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's in development right now. That will come out this year. All right. Well, you guys will have to stay in touch on that. Um, let's see. Let me see what kind of time we have. I think, Dick, I think we're going to get a question from you. we got a few minutes. So what do you got for your co-panelists? All right, I got a question for my co-panelists who have longer lived EMRs than our, our, our rather, uh, you know, it's kind of kindergarten level GM, EMR. We've been, I've been alive about five years. Um, 
and David in particular, what is the, so the pattern of errors has obviously changed over time. Um, the, the, uh, the data quality has changed over time. What have you learned or what should we learn about what to expect from changes in the regulatory environment, changes in the EHR, in the, in the user interface? What can you tell me to expect in the next five years from my own EHR and, and what data quality issues should I be looking for? Rob, you too. David, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll try to be quick. I mean, I, I think it's complicated. I mean, who knows what the regulatory environment will look like, you know, three to five years now, except it will be different than it is today. So I think yeah. you've always got to keep your, your sort of eye on that. I mean, hopefully your vendor will really help with that. I guess I, I would just say to me, the biggest thing I'm worried about that sort of keeps me up at night in this space is that external data. Because mm -hmm. what I just see is we're going to be, I mean, we want external data, particularly from a population health perspective, right? Because we know that patients get their care everywhere. But for those patients that I'm responsible for, I want data from the immunization registry, other healthcare systems, the payer. But the problem is the quality of that data um, is hugely variable. And again, part of the challenge with this is, this class, is I, I describe it as the... Um, the taillight phenomenon, right? You don't even know that you're sending out bad data. And unfortunately, a lot of times you don't really even care necessarily that much. You really mm -hmm. only care about the data right. coming to you. Mm -hmm. But people yep. have to have this shared concept of, hey, if, if I do a good job, you know, if, if I make the commitment to say my, the data I'm sending out is good, will you make the same commitment for the data that you're, that you're sending for me? But what I've seen so far, we do a ton of health information exchange, and most of our trading partners do not have that a robust concept around, hey, we've got to make sure that the data that is going out of our system through health information exchange has sort of, you know, basic QI processes and basic checking. And I'll, I'll just give you one example, a local healthcare system, um, they were sending out in their hemoglobin A1C LOINC codes the average glucose, mm. right? So think about that. Instead of Jeez. things like between, you know, eight and 14, we're getting yes. hemoglobin A1Cs coming into our system in like, you know, the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, the 400s. And they had been doing this for years. Wow. And, you know, it was a major project for me to figure out who to talk about that healthcare system to say, hey, you made this, you know, bad mistake, please fix it. But that's like <laughs> one data element. <laughs> <laughs> That, and and that is that's a really good message. The, and uh, Dale, this gets back to a, a database concept too, which is correction to the source. How do you, yeah. if you find an error, how do you tell somebody they made the error in an extensively HIE world? Yeah, totally agree, Dick. Yeah. Uh, Rob, any thoughts? Um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll sort of go on top of David's thoughts around the interoperability in the world because you know what most organizations view as interoperability um, because of the size of UPMC and the different venues of care, we, it, we have an intraoperability problem. So we also have to, to, to look at that and how we're actually exchanging information between our own systems. And so we actually see that lack of integrity of the data. Um, but I would say that over the last two and a half years, so just ahead of the pandemic, as sort of interoperability seemed to really start taking hold and more of these health healthcare exchanges were you know getting much more prominence and largesse and then also the the state of pennsylvania put in a requirement that every health plan that operates in the state has to actually be attached to an hie right and so that also has added some complexity and bloat but but the the you know i do feel bad about the integrity and quality of the data that UPMC itself has, has. but when I see what's coming in the pipes exter from external organizations, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite scary. And we've had to put a lot of thought as to what data that's actually viewed, we actually bring in as an appended part of our record. Because I think that it, 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 there's a lot of caution there and we used to think, oh, this is great. We're going to bring this all in and we'll have a much, much more complete picture. But the quality of what you're viewing and potentially thinking about including as part of that patient's record is 
frankly, not very good, quite poor. And so um, we, we've really stepped back because I think that that is something that we didn't sort of want the, we have enough of an internal data pollution problem that they, we didn't want to sort of compound that with an external data pollution problem. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely a whole topic there for another webinar. It sounds like a big issue. Um, we just have a few minutes left. What I want to do is what I'll call a lightning round of a final piece of advice. And what how I'd like to frame this is your best piece of advice for someone struggling with data quality at their health system, kind of quick, easy win, basic stuff, your, your best piece of just here's just something you have to do uh, to move things in the right direction. So um, lightning round. Uh, Dick, let's start with you. Have a so lightning round. Um, have a have a strategy. Understand the problems really there. Um, pick targets that matter. Pick targets that matter clinically, that matter financially, that matter operationally, and focus on those. You don't get don't get lost in the sea of data problems. You you can surf forever, uh, but focus and and have a strategy. And you've mentioned that a few times in the webinar today about focusing on things that matter. Does it matter? And if it does matter, is there anything you can do about it? So great right. points there. Rob? I, I agree with Dick. So focusing on uh, data related to use cases, they're important to your organization. And the other piece is you need to have really frank, detailed discussions around definitions because that, that, um, that really changes the believability, quote unquote, the believability or the interpretation, whether it's from a financial perspective, administrative or clinical perspective. David. I would definitely advocate again on focus on what matters. And the other thing I would say is, and this was alluded to a little bit, get it at the source. Sometimes it takes longer, it's more effort to figure it out at the source, but the, in, the, in the short term, it's gonna be more effort, but in the long term, it's much, much more worth figuring it out at the source. And David, you mentioned it was even difficult to figure out who the right person to speak to was, right? right. And to make that contact. So very interesting. Uh, Dale, we'll give you the final word. All right, you guys make it easy. Have a strategy, right? Have a data governance function with a data quality emphasis, fix data at the source. In the meantime, try to assess the downstream secondary use of data quality, right? Expose it with analytics so that people have an understanding of it but love all these thoughts, right? Have a strategy, care about data quality. It's so important. Hey, I would, by the way, Beckett Monkey, dear friend of mine, also a CMIO, he's been, you know, patiently waiting out I here. Know. To, you I know, I know, we just, we didn't have, Beckett, I'm very sorry. We saw your questions. We just didn't have really time to get them in, but I think Beckett's happy. He's a friend of yours, <laughs> tell him I'm sorry, okay? He's a dear friend, he's a dear friend. All uh, right. I would love to, I'd yeah, love to have a case since I'm paying for this, since I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Love, I would love to, I would, <laughs> we're having conversations now at the FDA, CDC, and ONC level that are really fruitful around data quality. And the more that CMIOs can collectively get a voice together, and I'd be happy to help do that too, friends. Now's the time to talk to federal authorities about how they can play a role in making this better for clinicians and for organizations. Dale, I love you. I swear, I swear to you, I love you. Four, I've had 400 webinars. The first sponsor who ever referenced the fact that he was paying for this. I love you, buddy. I love you. Um, great, great, incredible conversation. Incredible webinar. Uh, regarding continuing education, you could use the final slide in this deck. Uh, you'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready for viewing. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team. You see how much fun Dale had, so might be of interest. Um, and you go to our, web, our website to register for upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our panel, Dr. Rob Bark, Dr. David Kelber, Dr. Dick Taylor, and Dale Sanders. And I want to thank Intelligent Medical Objects for making the event possible and you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been great. Thank you.